Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we'll be going through verses 3 through 6 this morning. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And as we begin, just share with you a little bit of what's going on with Evidence and Answers. Coming this February, we are having our annual, uh, <coughs> uh, we pray we will be having our annual uh, Evidence and Answers conference. This year, we're going to have youth and adults together on the same campus there at Kalihi Union Church. The youth will be meeting in the gym. The adults will be meeting uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, we need the youth there to keep an eye on their parents, make sure that they're learning. They're getting some of this. So, Our theme this year is reclaim. What are we reclaiming? We are reclaiming the biblical definition that the enemy has redefined and perverted and twisted. All right? So we're going to be having uh, uh, sessions on why I am a Christian, the evidences for the Christian faith. Great one to have your unbelieving friends come to. We're reclaiming the image of God. What does it mean to be human? We have no idea anymore, right? Uh, what does it mean to be a man and a woman? We have no clue. We're reclaiming biblical manhood and womanhood, reclaiming marriage. What is marriage? Well, we don't know, okay? <laughs> um, we're speaking on reclaiming the race issue and social justice. Uh, so we're going to be reclaiming what the enemy has redefined and perverted. We've got some great speakers coming. Dr. Corey Miller, president of the fastest growing, one of the largest Christian college ministries in the world today, uh, Rachel Christie. So he'll be with us. And Glenn Stanton. He is the LGBTQI gender uh, expert there with focus on the family. He will also be with us. So just a great lineup of speakers and seminars for you. And then uh, we've got a session coming up this September 17th and 18th at the Wiley Baptist Church at their Waterhouse Lecture Series. I'll be speaking on archaeology and the Bible. The vast majority of scholars, Old Testament scholars and those in the archaeology field, especially those on a university and many seminary campuses, believe that the most of the New Testament is unhistorical up to King Ahab. Okay? Then you start having some history there. But until then, it's all fiction. All right? <clears throat> and so we're going to look at the archaeology defending okay, the historical reliability of the Old Testament there. A lot of their arguments come from archaeology from the 19th century. All right? We've discovered a ton since then. So come join us. It's free. There's food. Okay? And so two great nights there at Wiley Baptist Church. Okay? And also, we got some other exciting things coming up. It was 13 years ago that we took our first group on the Japan Christian History Tour, where we studied about the Japanese Christians who suffered the most severe persecution in the history of the church. Thousands upon tens of thousands would not renounce their faith in Christ and gave their life for Christ there. So there we are at the Nagasaki 20, uh, the Martyrs Museum, where the first 26 Christians were martyred for Christ. And you see a guy looking in a different direction. Back then, I was always wondering, very few people know about the Christian history of Japan and the courageous uh, testimony left behind by our forefathers, the Japanese Christians there. And I was always wondering, how can we get the story known to the world? Well, <clears throat> Uh, two other guys here from Hawaii had the same burden to reach Japan for Christ and have the story of the uh, Christians, uh, our forefathers in Japan, known to a greater part of the world. And so uh, we came together and came up with an idea. And uh, that's Mark Benson on your right, Stephen Sombrero. Uh, in the middle there. Mark Benson was the former owner of Honolulu Ford. Uh, he, you might recognize his name. He was the one that made the front page of the newspaper because he wouldn't open his car dealerships on Sundays. All right, And they said, you're crazy. You're going to go bankrupt. And became the number one car dealer in Hawaii. And Stephen Sombrero is one of the top real, real estate agents in Hawaii. Well, we came up with this idea that <clears throat> 
uh, uh, Mark now worked, was recruited by the Museum of the Bible. And Mark sat with us and said, hey, if we could get the Museum of the Bible to agree to feature Japan Christian history for a season, for a season, uh, and if you've been to the Museum of the Bible, it's massive. It's a billion dollar facility, six floors, started by the president of Hobby Lobby, teaming up with guys, Chick-fil-A, Toyota, uh, In-N-Out Burger, a whole bunch of uh, top Christian businesses. It's just five blocks from the Capitol. You can see the Capitol right there. That's the view right outside the window of the Museum of the Bible. If we could do that, we could have some, probably have dignitaries from DC and Japan showing up for the debut. And from that, uh, the, story, uh, the story of the J Japanese Christians uh, would be uh, promoted in a way we've never seen before. And perhaps from this, new Christian endeavors with the connections that the Bible Museum has and is building, will be investing in, in Japan and great Christian endeavors will be coming to the land. All right, so we met with the leaders of, we flew up there to DC, met with the Museum of the Bible, proposed our ideas, shared with them the Christian history of Japan. There we are with the leadership there. And they said, we love this project. We love it and we want to do it. All right, so we've got two years to put about $3 million together and pull this thing off, okay? <clears throat> and already, um, several people have chosen to partner with us. Nick Vujicic over there, no arms, no legs guy. Uh, heard about this, got excited. He's jumping on board. The president of Toyota, his name is Jack Hollis. He's a believer in Christ. He heard about it and he said, Toyota is on board. All right, so pray for us. Uh, we just got a couple years to pull this whole thing together and hopefully uh, we can uh, bring the project to pass, all right? You'll hear more about it as uh, we get closer. All right, let's pray together. Lord, teach us through your word. Let us come to it today with open ears and humble hearts to take on the challenge you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, recent events in Afghanistan reminded us that we are in a war with an enemy that wants nothing less than the destruction of America and her allies and Western civilization and to bring the entire world under the banner of a, of a dangerous ideology. And this enemy will never stop, will never compromise until the destruction of the United States and her allies is complete. And many Christians today have forgotten that we are also engaged in a war against a powerful force that seeks nothing less than our destruction. Second Peter says the devil roams around like a prowling lion seeking someone to befriend, to destroy, devour. That's what the enemy, he's never going to sleep, he's never going to compromise, he uh, uh, will either abide his time or will come up with numerous crafty ways to accomplish his purpose, the destruction of God's church and God's people. And our enemies will never stop, never compromise until God's people and God's church are dismantled or rendered powerless. And Paul shares in 2 Corinthians 10 the battle that all believers are engaged in and how we should engage in this struggle. 2 Corinthians 10.3 says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. First thing you've got to understand, folks, we are in a war. People don't like to hear that terminology. They don't like to hear conflict. They don't like to hear about war. Well, Paul repeatedly states in the New Testament, we are in a war, like it or not, 
We are in a war. Ephesians 6, I mean, is, is, is that using military terms or not? He says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual rulers, principalities, and powers of this dark age. And unfortunately, too many Christians have come to believe it is wrong and unbiblical to disagree with others. Our job is to be nice to everyone and accept and be accommodating to everyone. Believers have forgotten. We are in a struggle. We are literally in a war against not people, but false ideas that seek to dismantle our faith in Christ and render our faith powerless. Remember, the church and Christians, we do not proclaim and live out our message in isolation, but in the midst of a culture, of, in a world with powerful ideas that oppose God's truth. And the devil has made us believe engaging in battle against ideas opposed to the gospel is unloving, is unspiritual, that we're supposed to accept everyone and their beliefs to accommodate and compromise with the ideas of the world around us. The very thing that we are called to do, the enemy has made us believe that is unchristian and unbiblical. And today, many churches, many Christians refuse to stand their ground and instead have chosen to accommodate and compromise with the world. So in an attempt to be accepted by the world, many churches have chosen to say, come, let us tell you about Jesus, but we will make sure we will not teach or say anything that may upset you. And Christians, we forget, we're not here to be accepted and liked by the world. We're called to preach truth and engage false ideas and false teachers and false teachings with the truth of God's word and the power of his Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says, although we walk in the flesh, meaning we live in a world and we live in a fallen world and we live and possess frail and fallen bodies. Paul is saying here, we possess nothing supernatural in and of ourselves, but we live in frail bodies of clay, as he says. Therefore, when we engage in the struggle, in this war, we, we engage not according to the flesh. We do not rely on human resources that are void of divine power. <clears throat> we don't rely on methods of the world, on cunning, deception, big marketing budgets, glitzy advertising, smooth talk, and maneuvering. <clears throat> we are in a war and we're called not to be like the world or compromise with the world, but to engage in a battle against false ideologies of the world that oppose the truth of God's word. Imagine if we sent our soldiers out there to the Middle East. They're trained to engage in combat and defeat terrorism not to be liked or to be accepted or adopt their culture and ideas while still trying to remain American, but they're called to engage and defeat terrorist groups and organizations, all right? Imagine if you told our soldiers, when you go out there and you meet ISIS, compromise with them, adopt their values, try to be as much like them as possible, Try to give in as much. Try to do your best to be liked by them. And hopefully they'll play nice with us. No. I don't think you get any soldier to go on a mission like that. It'd be crazy. They're called to what? Engage and defeat the enemy. Because uh, they're looking to take you down. And today we see many churches compromising with the world. Presenting a message that says, we love you and we're just like you. We'll tell you about Jesus and some truths of the Bible, the stuff that makes you feel good, all right? But don't worry, 
We won't ever disagree with you. All right? We have many churches and ministries today that don't address the tough issues of our day and don't preach the tough passages. All right? I sit down with numerous elders from churches around the island and the country and say, shouldn't churches uh, be addressing this transgender stuff and this critical theory? It's destroying and splitting churches all over the place. Uh, sin, like alcoholism and adultery and divorce and uh, gay lifestyle, sh shouldn't church be addressing those things? And I said, absolutely. If the church doesn't, where is everyone going to get their answer from? They're going to get it from the culture, from the media, uh, from school, or whatever it may be. All right? <clears throat> if the church's not going to address those issues, people need to find the answer somewhere else, and they will. You know, and if we do not, and, and so that's why we're so glad that this church is willing to address those kind of tough issues like critical theory and others. But when we don't address those tough issues, when we don't preach those kind of tough passages, we end up with a compromised church, shallow in faith, with people living in sin, believing false doctrines, which end up dividing the body of Christ. <clears throat> you know, this is one of the reasons why preaching the Bible today in church is such a hostile, uh, I'm walking in such hostile arenas. Many people walk out, you know, as I'm speaking. You know, they'll often shout something at me, and then they'll walk, they'll make a big scene and walk out. Had it here in Hawaii, here in the U.S., <clears throat> You know, they walk out whenever I mention anything about the gay lifestyle being contrary to what the Bible teaches. Or that men and women are created different, designed different by God. I mean, they just shout something nasty and walk out. Or that Jesus is the only way to eternal life. Or if I say those who don't have Christ will be separated from him forever in hell. <laughs> it gets nasty in church. All right? Because why? Our churches are filled with people believing false doctrines, thinking, steeped in a sinful lifestyle, thinking, that's great. I'm accepted. I'm loved. Because no one's going to address those issues or tell me otherwise. And our children are being inundated in that in their schools and colleges, saying transgenderism is normal. All right? <laughs> the gay lifestyle is normal. Uh, Christians who say Jesus is the only way are racist. That's hateful, right? They're being inundated in that uh, five days a week. And when they come to church, all right, and they hear a pastor saying, you know, those separated from Christ spend eternity uh, separated from him in hell, they think, what a hateful, racist thing. I don't know if I want to be a part of this. Man, when I get 18 and out of my parents' uh, uh, authority, boy, I'm out of here. You know, that's kind of... Uh, our churches are filled with young people believing false doctrines, living in sin. And so our application for today is this. You need to understand we're in a war against spiritual powers and false ideas, holding people in captivity. Our calling is not to be liked by the world or compromise with the world, but to engage in battle against these false ideas. Remember, truth and love go together. All right? They always go together. The most loving act you can exercise is to share God's truth in love and turn people from believing a lie to truth that could set them free, as Jesus said. But remember, that very truth that could set them free could also offend those who refuse to open their hearts and minds to God's truth. So we must remember we're in a war. Second, a warrior must know their weapons and how to use them. Paul says here, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the forces against the Christian and the church that we must engage are not those of flesh and blood. Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They are not of this world. They're given by God, and only they can engage successfully 
in this struggle. And our weapons are powerful. He says they have divine power to destroy strongholds. So Paul is using the imagery here of siege warfare. Okay? Arrows, spears, and slings are of little use in breaking down fortress walls. What was needed to demolish fortress walls are heavy artillery back then. Okay? Battering rams, catapults. That's the heavy artillery back then. And the fortress walls here are false arguments and ideas that oppose God's truth. Paul pictures the mind as a fortress filled with false ideas that keep people from seriously considering the gospel message of Christ. The goal of the Christian often, before they're going to take us seriously, is to tear down those walls, those false ideas okay, that keep them from seriously considering the gospel. The Christian is to be equipped and demolish those arguments, the deceptions that people believe. <clears throat> and only, uh, re remember, okay, we don't preach and we don't live our message in isolation. We live it in a culture right, that uh, <clears throat> has powerful ideas that oppose the message of Christ. These false ideas are the strongholds okay, that keep people captive. Right? The strongholds today are the false ideas that oppose the message of Christ. Critical theory, right? the transgender movement, atheistic Darwinism, naturalism, relativism, pluralism, syncretism. Right? <clears throat> These are the strongholds that keep people from considering the message of Christ. And through training, the Christian is to dismantle these false arguments that fortify a person's unbelief and resistance to the gospel. We demolish these deceptions that people believe. And in demolishing these strongholds, <clears throat> it requires the heavy artillery. And Paul talks about the kind of weapons we have in Ephesians 6, right? Truth. The Word of God, righteous living, a life that's trusting daily in Christ, and prayer. These are what is needed to engage in the battle that stands before us. You know, <clears throat> I was talking to a mother after a conference. She came up to me and she says she can see her high school daughter walking away from the faith. And I said, why is that? She says, well, her friends in school and, all, and many of her teachers live the gay lifestyle. Many are going through transgender transformation. She's, uh, in, she's got friends who are atheists and other religions. And she says, I'm being constantly told, you, you know, you, this is normal. You must accept it. To, pre to believe anything else is hateful is racist and you're being a bigot and she said i, I can't uh, hold to a faith that's such a hateful religion like christianity i just can't you know and she could see that her daughter was moving away from the faith and she said what can i say what can i possibly say to her and i said well <clears throat> you have to understand the nature of truth Truth is narrow. Truth is absolute. Truth is exclusive. Okay? Two plus two equals four. Not six, not ten, not whatever I want it to. Oh, how narrow-minded. It can't be ten. How hateful. How racist. No, that's the way truth is narrow. Truth excludes its opposite. Truth is absolute. That's the nature of truth. Okay? Uh, if you go to your pharmacist, you better hope he has a narrow view of truth. Okay, if you say, hey, I need penicillin. He goes, well, you know, you can take this, you can take that. You, better, you know, here, how about some rat poison? You know, you better hope when you say, I need, you know, penicillin and this amount. He's got a narrow view of truth. When you say, now, how many pills do I take a day? 
You better hope he has a narrow view of truth. You know, if he looks at you and goes, whatever you want, whatever you want, two, three, ten, eh, go ahead, whatever makes you feel good. No, you better hope he has a narrow, your accountant, when you say, hey, how much money I got in the bank? You know, how much taxes am I going to pay? You know, you better hope he has a narrow view of truth. That's the nature of truth. It's unloving to let others be deceived by a lie. If they embrace a lie, it will lead to their destruction. The most loving thing you can do is to present the truth. Okay. So our application today is this. Okay. Christians must not only know God's truth, but the ideas that dominate our culture today. All right? Because that is what you see in the media. That's what your kids are facing, so your grandkids, uh, uh, your, your friends. That's what they're being bombarded with in school. So the Christian and church are called to engage the ideas and their culture for Christ. And that's why I'm glad Pastor Jason is passing out uh, Vody Bauckham's book, very outstanding Christian critique of one of the dominant theories of our day. So we're called to engage the false ideas of the culture. And what is our goal? Paul says here, to demolish strongholds and take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Okay? The terms here are warfare, of siege warfare, by which fortified walls are torn down. And these strongholds belong to the mind and the will. These false ideas that keep people from hearing and seriously considering the gospel, often we have got to tear down those arguments. Paul says here, we demolish strongholds. We destroy arguments. The Greek word there means it's a violent word, right? It means to dig down and overthrow. It means to destroy Okay? It means to demolish. Okay? <clears throat> and we're to demolish the false ideas that stand in opposition to God's truth and biblical teaching. And what's the goal? Take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Removing and replacing false ideas with biblical truth. That's what a Christian is called to do. I remember I was speaking to an atheist and his buddies, after uh, playing a round of golf, were there at the 19th hole. And someone shared with him, he said, Hey, have you ever considered, you know, going to church? And the, the gentleman looked at us straight with an angry face and said, I'd rather be in hell with my friends than going to church and going to heaven. And everyone was kind of stunned. And then everyone kind of looked at me like, what are we supposed to say? You know? And I kind of said, well, what, what, what would make you say that? He goes, how can a God of love send people to hell? What kind of religion is that? God makes people only and sends them to hell. And I said, well, <clears throat> God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go there. Right? Second Peter 3, God does not wish that anyone should perish, but all come to repentance. God's heart is for the whole world to come to believe in Christ. And he's gone out of his way to make the message known. If people go to hell, it's because they have chosen to reject God. All right? <clears throat> and God uh, is not a divine rapist. He's not going to force you to believe him. You will love me. You will love me or else. If you choose, if you don't want to be with God now, you won't want to be with him for eternity. So he allows you okay, to make that choice and be separated from him forever. All right? God doesn't make you go there. People choose to go there. <clears throat> he kind of looked at me and he said, well then, how can a loving God torture people in hell? What kind of God is that? You know, if I took a puppy here or a baby seal and I tortured that thing to death, I'd be thrown in jail. What kind of God is that? I said, oh, God doesn't torture people in hell. Luke 16 and other passages in the Bible says, people in hell are in torment, not torture. Torment is the word. Do you know the difference? Torture is from the outside. Someone inflicts it on you. Torment comes from within. It's self-inflicted. All right? It's like solitary confinement. No one is in there torturing the guy. All right? But why is solitary confinement so bad? Because they're in torment. 
They have to live with the crime that they have committed, separated from love and any kind of consolation that they may receive. They're there all by themselves living with that, and they are tormented. Right? So God's not torturing people there. They're tormented from within. Right? Well, then he looked at me and said, well, I'm an engineer and scientist by background. I need evidence. I need evidence. I'm not just going to believe something. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. I'm exactly the same way. And that's why I'm a Christian. There's more evidence for Christianity and the Christian worldview than for any other ideology out there. Much more than atheism. You know, that's why I became a Christian. The evidence was just too overwhelming. And he's kind of like, huh? You could see we were demolishing those strongholds, right? Those false beliefs that he was using to keep Christians at bay, to resist the truth of God's word, were being torn down. And suddenly you could see a new kind of openness to the message of Christ. Now, he didn't accept Christ that day, but you could see that walls were beginning to come down. So the application for us today is this. All Christians must get equipped to know the truth and engage the ideas of the culture for Christ. Okay? You may be sitting there thinking, I don't need to do that. That's for the pastors. That's for the elders. That's for the Sunday school teachers. Okay? Well, <laughs> your kids are inundated with this stuff. Okay? When they come home and they ask you, you're the front lines of defense there. Okay? <laughs> your junior high daughter is probably not going to call Pastor Jason and say, Pastor Jason, I got a question about this. All right? They're going to they're ask you. You're the front lines of defense here. Your grandchildren. Right? <clears throat> it's all our responsibility. Okay? And finally, Paul says here, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Paul stands alert and ready to punish the rebels. Okay? And these rebels are not those outside the church. These are people who have infiltrated the church. Okay? Paul is referring to those who are guilty of living in sin, promoting false ideas, and causing division in the body. So he says, when your obedience is complete, meaning when the church gets in line with God's truth, Paul wanted a unified church accomplishing this together. Okay? Not just the elders, not just the Sunday school teachers, everyone together. And that's why in Titus 1.9, the qualification of an elder is what? He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke, correct those who contradict it. All right? <clears throat> I'm going to address the men here particularly. You are, you are the watchman on the post all right, for your church and for your family to guard, okay, to defend against false teachings that seek to take your family and congregation captive away from the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> and I have, uh, you know, one of the things our country is concerned about is that as these refugees uh, from Afghanistan are coming in to our country by the thousands, Terrorists will infiltrate this group, disguising themselves as U.S. allies seeking asylum. And we've got to vet them, find, stand our guard, and be alert. False teachers and their teachings infiltrate the body of Christ under the guise that their ideas are true and in line with biblical teachings. And I have seen false teachings infiltrate churches and Christian organizations and divide and wreck uh, churches and Christian organizations. Critical theory is wreaking havoc in Christian organizations all throughout the United States. Right? Southern Baptist is going to split over this issue. Campus Crusade may split over this issue. <clears throat> Many of us in apologetics are, not a, are being asked to leave college campuses by Christian groups who have become inundated in critical theory. 
You know, the Christian Post article recently, uh, just this week, came out with an article that says more than 60% of evangelical Christians in America under the age of 40 believe that there are many paths to salvation. When Christians are rooted and grounded in love and truth, the two go hand in hand, okay? Then there is a beautiful unity there. Love, love, love alone doesn't build unity. Truth and love go together, okay? <clears throat> There's an ability to stand together against false teaching and the ideas that assault and infiltrate the body of Christ. That's why it's important that every believer in Christ know the truth, and know how to engage the false ideas of the culture for Christ. <clears throat> you know, in World War, during uh, World War II, Adolf Hitler began <clears throat> his quest to conquer Europe. And England, under the leadership of Neville Chamberlain, when Adolf Hitler began taking over the countries of Europe, England, under his leadership, conceded and compromised with Adolf Hitler. And Hitler ended up taking much of Europe captive to the Nazi Empire. It wasn't until Winston Churchill rose as the prime minister and leader of England. It is he who is the one who is willing to take his stand and engage the enemy in war, giving his famous speech, we will never surrender. And as the culture turns from God, the source of truth, they're quickly embracing false ideas that stand in opposition to Christ. And as the culture continues to go in that direction, let me warn you, biblical teaching will become more offensive to a culture that's turning away from God. God is the source of truth. When you turn away from the source of truth, you quickly and willingly embrace ideas that are false and in opposition to truth. So remember, <clears throat> we're not called to make peace with the world, but to engage in battle against false ideas that stand opposed to Christ with truth and love. We're to remain faithful to our call to defend truth and engage false ideas and to set the captives free until the king returns. Winston Churchill, outnumbered, outgunned, stood against the Nazi empire all alone there in Europe. Courageously he did. He took his stand as the Germans were ready to uh, cross the English Channel and come on into England. And he vowed to take his stand. And as he did, uh, he withstood, okay, vastly outnumbered, until the United States came into the battle and the Nazi Empire was destroyed. And we're called to do the same. No matter how unpopular we may become, how outnumbered, outresourced we may be, we take our stand and engage our culture for Christ until the King returns. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that we would take up this challenge that you've given us in 2 Corinthians 10.5 to engage a lost world for Christ using the gifts and weapons you have given to us. Truth, your word faithful and righteous living and prayer. May we be faithful to the call placed upon us until your return. I pray this for Mililani Community Church and all churches who call upon the name of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.